If you saw Dillinger back then, you know what I'm talking about. Like their shows were a legitimate threat to your physical safety. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about a genre known as mathcore. And if you clicked on this video, then you probably already know what it is. But for any of you who may not be familiar, when I say mathcore, I'm referring to bands like Botch, Dillinger Escape Plan, and their lesser aggressive descendants like The Fall of Troy. Bands that sound like this. <laughs> or this. And before I go any further, I wanna apologize for my Lindsay Lohan party girl voice. I did a jujitsu tournament this weekend and I got choked so hard that I haven't been able to talk right for like four days. Not even joking. Shout out to Luis Sanchez for that. Also, we are moved into our new house, but I haven't gotten my old background set up yet. That's coming soon. But anyway, getting back to mathcore, the whole point of the genre is to play discordant, deliberately weird, jarring kind of stuff. That's basically the exact opposite of what anybody would call accessible or easy to listen to. And so in some ways, it's always been kind of anti-commercial by design, but somehow or another, there was this moment where mathcore kind of managed to sneak into the edges of mainstream culture. Dillinger Escape Plan got tons of love from outlets like Rolling Stone, The Fall of Troy had a hit song, Guitar Hero, and what I guess you would call mathcore adjacent bands like the Mars Volta and Chiodos were hitting the Billboard Top 10. But that was about 15 years ago. Those days are long behind us. Mathcore is nowhere near the mainstream now. And so in that sense, I suppose you could say that Mathcore died in the late 2000s. But actually, I feel like the opposite. If anything, thanks to the internet's ability to nurture communities around these like extremely niche interests, as somebody who was there from pretty much the beginning, I would say that Mathcore is now almost definitely like 10 times more popular than 20 years ago when it was arguably at its creative peak. But for me personally, as somebody who kind of saw it grow from nothing into what it became and was super into it at one point in my life, I kind of lost interest because the genre went from something that was fresh and exciting and unpredictable. I mean, the whole point of it is that you kind of never knew what to expect. It went from that to being, at least for me, a little bit predictable and stale. It became just another sound. So what exactly happened? What was behind Mathcore's rise, fall, and rise again? And what is the lasting legacy and impact of Mathcore today? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. Also, I wanted to mention that I'm now on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week. I also started a Discord that's now over 4,000 members, and there's links to both of those things in the description of this video. But first, I want to thank Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video. And if you are a coffee fan like I am, then you are going to want to check out Trade. They help you explore coffees curated to your specific taste and deliver them right to your door, shipped directly from the very best local roasters. Step one is you take their quiz answer questions about how you like your coffee, and Trade will curate matches just for you. Step two is to choose your delivery frequency. Just pick what you want and it will get delivered right to your doorstep, delivered at peak freshness so you never run out of coffee again. And then step number three, rate and repeat. Rate your coffee matches so Trade can continue to delight you with coffee matches that you're gonna love. One thing I really like is how they send everything with compostable packaging. I like the sustainability angle that they have going on there, very cool. And if you're into supporting local companies, then this is a great way to do it. And the quality is actually way better than going to the supermarket or whatever, because it's way, way more fresh. The coffee is actually shipped within 24 hours of ordering. And also Trade guarantees that you will love your first coffee. But if for whatever reason you don't love it, you're good, just let them know and they will ship you out a different bag for free. My viewers will get their first bag free when they sign up. Just take the quiz by clicking the link in the description of this video. And just in case that's not enough, free shipping is also included. But first, let me start by kind of backing up a little bit and setting the stage for the birth of Mathcore. The first thing to understand is that Mathcore is 100%, no question, a product of the hardcore scene. That might seem kind of obvious from the name since it has core in it, like hardcore, but I think a lot of people have either forgotten that or maybe never even really knew it, and it actually is important 
important because hardcore is part of punk and punk was started in many ways as a reaction to what they saw as the bloated, overly complex, self-indulgent music of the 70s. Dudes with feathered hair playing these like five minute long ballads with elaborate arrangements, spending six months and millions and millions of dollars in the studio. And then Punk came along and said, fuck all that shit. We can barely play our instruments. Our recording budget is 50 bucks and we don't care. So here's a two minute three chord song and we hope you fucking hate it. And so the key point here is that it was actually an essential part of the early punk and hardcore ethos to be deliberately simple, like almost offensively simple, which was cool. But like anything else, it gets old after a while. And so a few bands came along and said, you know what? What if it wasn't simple? Wouldn't it actually be kind of cool to start playing super weird, obtuse, deliberately complex, difficult music as a reaction to punk? Black Flag was an early example of that, who started getting weird around like the early to mid 80s. For example, they did a whole album in 1985 called The Process of Weeding Out. That's all these like five to nine minute long meandering, weird instrumental songs that are like half punk, half kind of jazz, half just scronky weird noises. <laughs> Were bands like Today is the Day and the Jesus Lizard and the rest of the amphetamine reptile scene that weren't quite as bizarre as that, but still took a decidedly weirder, noisier, discordant kind of take on punk and metal. And in San Diego, Drive Like Jay, who, who kind of laid the groundwork for the more like noodly post-hardcore sound that bands like Dance Gavin Dance would end up doing 20 years later. So that stuff was going on all over the place, but it didn't really make its way into the hardcore scene for the most part. These were all just kind of bands doing their own thing on like the periphery for the most part, other than like Black Flag, obviously. These are bands just kind of operating kind of on their own, not really part of anything. But that changed around the mid nineties when mathcore started to emerge as kind of its own little subgenre. Which brings us to the next section, the early years of mathcore. And as far as I'm concerned, the one band that hands down kicked off this whole thing was a man called Rorschach from New Jersey. Sadly, you don't really hear their name come up that often these days, but in my opinion, they were the band that really bridged the gap between all the discordant avant-garde stuff that was going on, like Voivod and the Jesus Lizard and the hardcore scene. Now, they weren't the biggest band in the world, which is the reason why you've probably never heard of them, but they were a super active part of the hardcore scene around then, and they played with absolutely everybody in like the New Jersey, New York kind of area. From straight edge bands to grindcore to emo bands, even a few pop punk bands here and there. I think I remember them playing with like Doc Hopper. And they were one of those bands where no matter what scene you were talking about, like everybody fucked with Rorschach because they were just that good. And they were so far ahead of the curve. Like they were doing stuff like this back in like 91, 92, 93. And after Rorschach broke up, their guitarist Keith Huckins started a new band called Dead Guy, which pretty much picked up where they left off. And I would consider Dead Guy to be one of the most underrated bands in the entire history of hardcore. It's really a shame that they don't get the love that they deserve. And as far as I'm concerned, Keith Hawkins is the godfather of mathcore, period, end of story. Although he probably wouldn't agree with me because he's way too humble to ever say anything like that, but it is a fact. And Dead Guy was able to reach a much bigger audience than Rorschach ever did because they signed to Victory Records, who were the big dogs of hardcore back then. Nobody could market better than Victory did at that time. Everybody who heard the Dead Guy album Fixation on a Coworker had the exact same reaction I did, which was like, holy fuck, what is this? What is even going on? This just like destroyed my brain. You're just this really intense machine. 
Dead guy didn't have any of the trappings. They didn't have any of the bullshit attached to him. Fixation is, it's undeniable. And within a couple years of that, the math core scene was popping off all over the country. Still very small, you know, these bands were playing to 20 or 30 people, but there was definitely something happening. There was Coalesce in Kansas City who created the template for what Norma Jean did a decade later. <laughs> Up here in the Northwest, we had Nine Iron, Spitfire, and Botch. I'm very fortunate that I got to see Botch's very first shows in Seattle around like 94 or so, as well as their last show in 2002. And I think of them as really kind of the updated dead guy. And of course, Converge up in Boston. And in my opinion, hands down the best band to ever do mathcore, Dillinger Escape Plan. Today is actually the 22nd anniversary of their first album, Calculating Infinity, which came out in 1999. And I don't think anybody will ever do this style better than they did on that album. It's just, it's a 10, period. And so even though the math core scene was still really small, it was turning a lot of heads because it was just so different. What's important to remember is that the late 90s were the peak of the Victory Records style of like vegan straight edge hardcore. Like if you took a time machine back to 1997, the default template for a hardcore band would be dudes in Tommy Hilfiger jackets and Janko shorts playing like very simplistic chugga chugga kind of riffs with some goofy lyrics about brotherhood or revenge or whatever. Every city had like 10 of these bands and they all sounded exactly the same, which is cool. I mean, I did like a lot of that moshcore stuff. It was fun, but the mathcore bands were clearly coming from a more sophisticated place, especially Dillinger, who I think had the broadest musical palette of all those bands. They were pulling from everything from like Cynic and King Crimson to Mahavishnu Orchestra to where it was almost like they brought in those elements of jazz and fusion, but somehow infused them with the aggression of hardcore. If you saw Dillinger back then, you know what I'm talking about. Like their shows were a legitimate threat to your physical safety. I loved watching Ben just not give a single fuck and swing his like pointy ass ESP guitar around and catch people on the head. You'd see people walk out of there bleeding like it was a Gigi Allen show. It just felt fresh and exciting and challenging in a way that hardcore at the time had sort of stopped being. Hardcore in the late 90s was booming, which was cool, but at the same time, it had just become kind of basic and meat heady. And mathcore was a really refreshing counterpoint to all that. It was a little bit left of center and challenging, kind of kept you guessing, but still aggressive and pissed off and heavy. Which brings us to the next section of this video, the evolution of mathcore starting around like the early 2000s. This is when the scene really started to evolve. Although I don't remember anybody using the term mathcore back then, just to be clear. But this is when the stuff that I personally found most interesting started to happen. I'm not sure if this was deliberate, but this is when bands were taking the mathcore sound to a whole other level of just chaos and weirdness that almost reminded me of like a hardcore version of weird free jazz like Cecil Taylor. Again, this wasn't a big scene by any means, but you started to see a lot of this stuff happening. My personal favorite artist doing this stuff would be Chrom Tech and Orth Realm. To me, they're like the perfect example of that idea of being like the hardcore version of Ornette Coleman. Just total chaos, but somehow in a way that feels very deliberate and thoughtful, almost like a meta comment on their own genre. Definitely not the easiest stuff in the world to listen to. So if that's a little bit too out there for you, you might wanna check out Hella and Lightning Bolt who did kind of a more accessible version of that sound that was still pretty cool, but not quite as crazy and aggressive. And a few bands like Behold the Arctopus, who came along and put a little bit more of like that precise, structured, metallic kind of spin on the free jazz, freak out style of mathcore. Yeah. 
And as somebody who was also listening to a lot of weird fusion and avant-garde free jazz back then, I really appreciated this super experimental version of Mathcore, but of course, obviously, nothing like this was ever gonna have any kind of commercial appeal because it was almost designed with the express intent of being difficult and inaccessible. Which brings us to the next section, what I guess you would call the peak of Mathcore. The weird moment that I talked about in the beginning where Mathcore bands kinda did have some measure of commercial success. Or if you wanna be like a total genre nerd, as I'm sure lots of people in the comments will be, I guess to be more precise, you could call them like Mathcore adjacent post-hardcore bands, but close enough as far as I'm concerned. And honestly, I'm still not really sure how this happened. The mid 2000s were just wild like that. I would say that the beginning of this maybe was at the drive-in, who had been around for a while, but really broke out in 2001 with Relationship of Command. I remember them getting a ton of love from the press around then, and even getting a pretty fair amount of MTV airplay for a song that would have fit in just fine with Drive Like Jehu back in the early 90s. Yes, this is the campaign slither in sales in the cargo bay. Pretty challenging stuff. Another mathcore band that blew up around this time was The Fall of Troy. From lovely Muckleteo, Washington, definitely go check out the Lighthouse Museum and ride the ferry if you ever happen to be in town. They had a little bit of what I guess you would call like a mini hit when their song FCP Remix blew up in Guitar Hero. Yeah. Another mathcore-ish band that got a lot of exposure around that time was Every Time I Die. They also had a song in Guitar Hero 2 that I remember being really popular with kids. And I actually think that those two Guitar Hero songs alone are responsible for a big, big chunk of kids getting into this sound. Because remember how fucking huge those games were. They were selling tens of millions of copies. They were like the most popular, most ubiquitous like Christmas gift around that time. And I think a whole generation of like fifth through seventh graders got into punk and metal through those games and it was probably their first exposure to this sound. Chiodos also went to number five on Billboard in 2007 with Bone Palace Ballet and back then they were usually labeled as one of those quote-unquote gay scene bands but if you actually listen to their music the heavy parts of that stuff are really not that far off from Botch or Converge. It wasn't necessarily the most innovative stuff in the world you know you had heard that sound many times before if you're a part of the hardcore scene but like I talked about in my under Oath video, it was new to this audience. Bands like them and Norma Jean brought the sound of Botch and Coalesce to a whole new audience. And on a less commercial level, there were a lot of what I guess you would call underground bands doing a lot of stuff that took the genre forward creatively. For example, Tony Danza Tap Dance Extravaganza, or maybe the only band that could maybe kind of sort of almost compete with Dillinger on a technical level, Protest the Hero, and maybe in hindsight, the best band of this era, the number 12 looks like you. And so there was all this stuff happening that took Mathcore to a level of commercial success and like mainstream recognition that I never thought was possible. But that's also what created a fundamental shift in the scene. Meaning that by this point, the scene had pretty much completely lost any kind of connection to hardcore. With the exception of a few bands like Every Time I Die and Dillinger, obviously, who were products in the 90s hardcore scene, but a lot of the newer bands weren't. And that's not a bad thing necessarily, but it was an important shift because it kind of changed the context. Now, instead of bands playing this weird discordant music almost as a fuck you to the sometimes dogmatic, overly simplistic punk and hardcore scene, now they were doing it just because they thought it was cool and fun to play riffs with a lot of notes in them. Because what guitarist doesn't like doing that, right? And that's totally cool, but this is the point where I kind of started to lose interest. Because this is where the genre started being experimental and avant-garde and kind of just started to become another word for songs with noodly guitar parts, a lot of notes, and weird time signatures for the sake of having weird time signatures. Again, absolutely nothing wrong with that, but what drew me to Mathcore in the 90s was that it wasn't really tied to any specific sound. It was just about being experimental and avant-garde and pushing the boundaries of what punk and hardcore could be. And also, as I got older and learned more about music, I kind of realized that playing a lot of notes just because you can isn't really crazy. It's actually kind of the opposite. It's really just self-indulgent. And it quickly leads down the road of guitarists making music for other guitarists, which is pretty much what mathcore is these days. But with that said, 
Who really gives a shit what I think? Because obviously the math course scene was doing just fine without me. Which brings us to the next section, the present day. What is the state of math core in 2021? We could argue all day about what math core even means, but to me, it could really cover any kind of heavier, more aggressive music where there's a deliberate emphasis on being technical and weird. That admittedly covers a lot of ground, but that's what I'm gonna go with for now. And by that definition, I would say that math core is anything but dead. It's actually stronger than ever now. It just lives on the internet. Because as somebody who was there in the 90s and this stuff was just kind of bubbling up, let me just explain that it was not popular at all, in the slightest. Nobody cared about this shit. I saw botch play shows to like 10 to 30 people many times. I saw Prime Dillinger with Dimitri. That was the best lineup of the band. I don't care what anybody says. I saw them play to like 100 people. And that was fun. It was cool. We enjoyed ourselves. But my point is that it was not a big scene at all. And I think it's way cooler now that thanks to the internet, you can put up a video of yourself playing your cool new math core riff on TikTok and you might get 600,000 views in a day. And so even though the era of math core-ish kind of bands being in the mainstream is over, in a way, the scene is healthier than ever. That's why the newer generation of mathy bands like Carbomb, Polyphia, and Chon are actually able to make a much better living now than they could have 25 years ago. I'm sure people recommend a lot of other good bands in the comments, but a couple of my personal favorites from this generation would be Frontierer. Terrible name though. It's almost like the rural juror. I also really like Vane and Sea Space Cowboy, who I would see as kind of the purest incarnation of that late 90s, early 2000s mathcore kind of sound. But what I think is really interesting is how much mathy influences have made their way into genres that you wouldn't normally think would have anything to do with mathcore. For example, like Belmont, who put mathy kind of riffs into pop punk, and it actually works a lot better than I would have thought. Which brings us to the last question, what is the legacy of Mathcore? For one, I think it's interesting that it's always gotten a lot of critical love from outlets that normally wouldn't touch metal or hardcore with a 10 foot pole. I'm honestly not really sure why, I guess probably because it's popular with like nerdy white dudes. People who write for Pitchfork, Brooklyn Vegan, Rolling Stone, The Village Voice, those kind of outlets, they love this stuff and so it's gotten a lot of press coverage and I think probably exposed people to extreme music that otherwise might not have found out about it. But to me, what's most interesting is just how popular it actually is, given that it's inherently, deliberately not at all accessible. Like the deliberate intent of the genre is like, write stuff that makes your head hurt. Like if you do that, that's a successful math core song. And yet, despite that, you go, look, I mean, this stuff gets millions and millions and millions of streams. And I don't really know why, other than to just kind of say that if you're a nerdy dude who's really into video games and guitar and all the other stuff that my life revolved around when I was in my teens and 20s, there's just something about math core that people like me at that age just can't resist. It was true for me, and it's true for the current generation, and it's probably gonna be true for kids 10 or 20 years from now. And so I think it's actually ended up being a surprisingly big gateway way into extreme music for this generation of fans and artists. Like how many 24 year old dudes who are posting TikToks of themselves playing math core riffs right now started out by getting their minds blown by FCP remix in 2007. I would guess it's not a small percentage. And so although math core in one sense may not be putting up the kind of mainstream numbers that it did in the 2000s, I think it actually lives on in many, many other ways and is arguably more alive than ever. All right, my friends, that does it for this video on Mathcore. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, check me out on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week. Join the Discord. We're up to over 4,000 members now. There's links to both of those in the description. And also, as always, I want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. I'm genuinely very grateful for your support. Patrons get every one of my podcasts a week early. There are patron-only channels in the Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways and Q&As sometimes. Times. There's also a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else that you want to get my eyes and ears on. So if any of that sounds cool to you, you can join the Patreon at the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.